Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia, one story at a time. And welcome in once again to another episode of the podcast. I'm Steve Gilley, and today we're going to tell you a very interesting story about a very interesting character in East Tennessee by the name of John Randolph Neal Jr. Now, what's so important about Mr. Neal? Well, he was involved in not one, but two historic events that occurred in Tennessee in the 20th century. Now, Mr. Neal was born on September 17, 1876. His father was a Confederate Army officer. He was born in Ray Springs, Tennessee, and went to the University of Tennessee, where he graduated with his undergraduate degree in 1893, got his law degree from Vanderbilt Law in 1896, and a Ph.D. in history from Columbia in 1899. Now, Mr. Neal then went on to teach law at the University of Denver in Colorado, and here's the first interesting thing about him. In 1906, while he was teaching in Denver, he was elected to the Tennessee House of Representatives from Ray County while living and teaching part of the year in Denver. He'd come back to Tennessee back and forth. And this, is, of course, is before the days of airplanes, fast trains, automobiles, and all that. So he'd have to come back by train to spend what little time he could in Ray County and in Nashville while he was taking care of uh, state business. Anyway, he uh, served one term in the Tennessee House. Then in 1908, he was elected to the Tennessee Senate, and that's where his political career came to a crashing halt. He uh, ran afoul of the governor and other Democrats in the legislature. He was primaried out in 1910. But by that point, in 1909, Mr. Neal was teaching law at my old alma mater, the University of Tennessee College of Law in Knoxville. While there, he gained a reputation as being a, a little bit odd. I guess you could call him the original um, absent-minded professor. Uh, he would miss classes. He would miss tests. But that's okay, because if you took one of his classes, he gave you a 95. Pretty much guaranteed. Uh, he was known for not bathing and for wearing the same suit for... <laughs> Days at a time. He also had a habit of not cashing checks, tuition checks, paychecks, what have you. A lot of the students there at the University of Tennessee School of Law ended up getting a free education because Professor Neal didn't cash their check. Anyway, this went on for a few years, but in 1923, Mr. Neal's career as a law professor at UT came to a crashing halt in an incident called the Slaughter of the PhDs. In 1923, uh, UT President Harcourt Morgan, for whatever reason, decided to let seven professors go from the university. And a lot of the folks said it had to do with some of the professors wanting to teach the theory of evolution. Professor Neal supposedly represented one of the professors, or at least advocated for one of the professors and got himself on the list. Any event, Neil and the other six professors were let go from UT. Professor Neil appealed to Governor Austin P. and got a review board hearing for all seven. However, after hearing evidence, there was a vote of five to two to sustain President Morgan's dismissal of those professors. And as a result, Mr. Neil went out and did the only rational, reasonable thing. He started his own law school. <laughs> The John Randolph Neal School of Law right there in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now, this was a part-time school. You didn't go full-time. If You know you could work wherever you worked and then go to school at night, part-time. Did very well up until 1943 when the state legislature passed a law requiring full-time attendance at law school. And then the John Randolph Neal School of Law came to an end but that's not the end of Mr. Neal's story, because now we're getting into those two famous things that he was involved in. The first one involved the theory of evolution. If you remember, in your history classes, uh, at least in mine, we talked about the Scopes Monkey Trial, which was held in Dayton, Tennessee in 1925. 
And as most of you have heard, that was basically Clarence Darrow uh, versus William Jennings Bryan over the teaching of evolution. John Randolph Neal was appointed as the lead counsel for the defense, and he remained in that position for the entire trial. The ACLU is the one who brought him in. Neal, in turn, brought in Clarence Darrow over objections from the ACLU that Darrow would turn it into a trial against religion, which, of course, he did. Neal agreed with the ACLU and became upset with Darrow over this. Neil wanted to characterize this as a, a trial on the freedom of learning. Lots of conflict between Darrow and Neil. They both, each of them, tried to get the other one removed from their position, but were unsuccessful in it. As you probably know, the Scopes Monkey trial ended up with John T. Scopes, the teacher convicted of violating Tennessee law against teaching evolution, and I think he got like a $20 fine or something like that. The ACLU wanted to appeal this, and they did. However, Professor Neal missed a particular appeals deadline on providing certain reasons for the appeal, which meant that certain proof couldn't be presented on appeal. As a result, the ACLU didn't fire him, but they did minimize his role. However, he did stay on through the appeal process. Now, the other thing that John Randolph Neal was important uh, as far as Tennessee is concerned uh, had to do with the TVA. Neal advocated for public development of Tennessee River Recreation and Power for many years through the 20s and up into the 30s. In fact, he appeared at most all meetings that involved the, uh, the Tennessee River's future, whether he was invited or not, and very loudly made his opinions known. Often he was the only one who wanted public control of the river, unsuccessfully, until he managed to get a hold of Tennessee Senator George Norris. He managed to influence and convince Norris that the river's future should be under public control. As a result, Senator Norris in January 1926 convinced the Federal Power Commission to suspend any further action on bids for dams on the Tennessee River while introducing legislation in the Senate to turn over development of the river to the federal government. Now, that bill, that act, didn't get anywhere until the 1930s when Franklin Roosevelt became president, and that act became law and became the basis for the Tennessee Valley Authority. Was John Randolph Neal happy about all that? Well, we don't know. We do know that he continued to criticize very loudly the TVA. Uh, over things like wages for their employees, favoritism toward big business, and TVA's slowness in buying up private property companies. But once the TVA bought up those private power companies, was Mr. Neal happy? No, 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 no. Then he complained about the lack of taxes for the local communities because the companies had been bought out. You couldn't satisfy this guy. Any event... Um, Irony of ironies, his land at Ray Springs was inundated by a TVA lake. Uh, Neil sued TVA and won $55,000 in damages. Now, even though his political career ended uh, way back in the teens, 1910, 1912, Neil ran for senator an additional 18 times, governor nine times, and for the U.S. House of Representatives one time, and he won exactly Zippo. Yeah. <laughs> he lost all of them. Um, Mr. Neal was involved in several liberal causes throughout the South through the 20s and 30s. For example, he represented a couple of Gastonia, North Carolina cotton mill workers, defending them of killing a foreman during a strike in 1929. Also in 1929, he came to Elizabethton and defended striking workers. He was an advocate for striking students at Lincoln Memorial University, and in 1932, he defended some striking workers in Harlan, Kentucky, who had been chased out of Harlan. Uh, no word on how well he did in defending any of those folks there, but he certainly was an advocate for people who were striking for uh, better wages and for their rights against their employers. Now, one habit that I think I did mention is a habit that he had of never cashing checks that he received. In fact, that $55,000 that he got from the Tennessee Valley Authority, well, TVA accountants were trying to balance their books later on, and they couldn't because that $55,000 check 
was still out there. So a TVA accountant came out to his house, confronted Mr. Neal about the checks. Said, Man, you got to cash that check. We've got to get that reconciled. So he dug around in his pockets. He found several other checks. And way back in the bottom of his back pocket, he found the check for $55,000 all wadded up, which he then endorsed and cashed and TVA got their books reconciled. After the Scopes Monkey trial, this habit of not bathing and wearing the same suit for days at a time got even worse. In fact, his hygiene dropped even more as he was banned from the S&W cafeteria in downtown Knoxville and was kicked out of the Watauga Hotel in Knoxville where he was living because he would not keep the hotel uh, room clean nor himself. I'm sure he had quite a fragrant odor, so to speak. Anyway, he retired to southeast Tennessee in the Ray County area and died November 23rd, 1959 in Rockwood, Tennessee. And that's it for this week's edition of Stories, a history of East Tennessee and Southwest Virginia. We appreciate you listening. If you'd like to leave a comment, please feel free to do so on the blog at storiespodcast.net. You can also subscribe to the podcast at iTunes or at Stitcher. Or if you go to the blog, you can subscribe on your favorite Android device. We've got some buttons on the post that say iTunes and Android. Pick which one you like and subscribe there. So until next week, y'all take care. We'll see you then. 